plan and as for my... sorry yeah no i think um, um, richard can start and i can just uh, you know complement his session with uh, with an example from nepal okay would you then um, prefer not to do like a like a full presentation would you prefer to do no like no a... yeah i would just like to compliment on whatever richard has spoken uh, from a nepali context so i don't have a powerpoint presentation as such but then i can just add on to yeah compliment his session that was what i wrote to richard as well yesterday oh, that's fine thanks. with me yeah yeah thanks well perfect can everyone hear us yes um, yes um, Folks, can before people... we get started, I'm sorry to interrupt, but before we get started, I just wanted to remind the international speakers that we have uh, interpretation available today. So at the bottom of your uh, Zoom screen, there will be a toolbar. In the toolbar, there is an icon called interpretation. Uh, it would be wise for international uh, speakers to click on that uh, uh, link on that uh, button called interpretation and select English because if someone speaks in Portuguese, the interpreter is going to turn Portuguese into English for you and you don't have to do anything else, okay? I'm sorry, Beatriz, you can continue now. Sorry for interrupting. No problem. Um, something else is that uh, since we're having simultaneous translation, our interpreters ask the speakers if it would be possible to avoid speaking too fast. Um, but I think everyone can hear us, so we can start. So hello, everyone. Welcome to the last day of our ECR workshop. My name is Beatriz, and I'm a joint training lead for HERA and part of the Brazilian HERA team. And I'm very happy to introduce the session their team had the opportunity to suggest for the workshop. So our session today is about power dynamics in the definition of concepts and methodologies in Global Health Partnership. And we'll have two very interesting speakers, Dr. Punan Grishel and Professor Richard Parker. So we will start with Professor, Prof Professor Richard Parker who is a professor emeritus of social medical science and anthropology and a member of the Committee on Global Thought at Columbia University in New York, as well as a senior visiting professor in the Institute for Study of Collective Health at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. He is also the director and president of the Brazilian Interdisciplinary AIDS Association, as well as a founder and co-chair of Sexuality Policy Watch and founder and chair of Global AIDS Policy Watch. He's a founding editor of the journal Culture, Health and Sexuality and an editor in chief of Global Public Health. So, Professor. Thank you very much. I'm turning on the camera, so hopefully people will be able to see me at least momentarily, but I'm also going to try to put on uh, a PowerPoint presentation, if I can make the screen share do what I want it to do, um, which so far it's not doing. Let me see, maybe if I move this up and, and try doing it again. Uh, this is always one of my uh, paranoias with, um, hmm, with, let's see. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so uh, let me go back to the start. Um, first, thanks uh, to the organizers for the invitation to participate. Uh, I know just a little bit about uh, your, your program and, and am, am very impressed with it. Uh, and it's, a, it's obviously a great pleasure to be able to be with you to talk about uh, this issue of, uh, I'm just calling what I'm gonna say, reflections on the role of power uh, in the definition of concepts and methodologies in, in global health partnerships. Um, 
it, it's, it's really going to be a presentation based in many ways on my own experience working in global health and in partnerships for now nearly 40 years um, with uh, uh, trying to, to uh, punctuate uh, some issues that are worth thinking about to be able to address these issues. Um, the structure of the presentation uh, will be fairly simple. Um, I'm really breaking it into three parts. In a, a first section, I'm going to talk about theories of power uh, and the way that they flow into some fields of power uh, that may be helpful to us to think about the, the research process and the way in which uh, collaborative research uh, operates in, in relation to, to power. Um, then I wanna talk a little bit about what I'm calling the historical backdrop of global health uh, in the second part of the presentation, um, which is really how the history of global health um, creates a kind of layering effect in, in which historical relations of power are always with us, whether we're aware of it or not. Um, and, and the point of this is to help make us aware of how and why um, that backdrop is important for us to think about and respond to. Um, and then in the third part, um, I'll talk about what I'm calling seeking equity and justice in global health collaborations. Uh, given the fact that power is always present, um, there's no way out of it. Um, so one has to think uh, uh, critically and reflexively about how to, to to build equity and justice more fully into uh, global health uh, collaborations and particularly research collaborations in, in relation to the issues that I'm talking about today. Um, also, uh, I, I should mention some, uh, what I'm calling key considerations for my point of departure. Power and its relationship to knowledge um, it has been a focus of mine uh, over the course of, of my career. Um, and and it's, it's clearly what is the point of departure for, for thinking about um, everything I'm gonna say in this, uh, in this presentation. But the other, uh, the second issue uh, that I think is fundamentally important is the, the uh, relationship between North and South in, in global health um, and the tensions that exist there um, and the power relations that exist there uh, and how they um, uh, come into the research process and how we can think about them in ways that may help us manage them more effectively. Um, and the third thing is just to say that clearly my own trajectory as a, as a researcher um, shapes a lot of what I have to say. I'm, I, I'm uh, from the United States, uh, was born in the US, but for 40 years I've, I've worked in Brazil um, and, and over the course of those 40 years, I basically split my time between um, the US uh, and, and Brazil. I've had academic, academic appointments both in Brazil and in the United States. Um, and I've moved back and forth uh, uh, every couple of weeks for a, a long period of time. Um, so in, in some ways I'm sort of betwixt and between North and South um, and that colors the way I look at these kinds of issues. I can't escape um, my northern origins, but a, a lot of what I see when I analyze global health is from the perspective of someone working in the global south. Um, and I have a fairly critical take on, on the way in which global health has developed a, a, as a field, uh, in, in large part because I think that um, the global north has tended to dominate the field more than it should, um, and, and it's, it's fundamentally important in the future to try and, and build a, a more equitable field in, in which visions and perspectives from the south are equally important, um, particularly since so much global health work uh, is, is aimed at responding to issues that affect populations in the, in the global south. But so I'm a, I'm a bit uh, uh, in between North and South. And I'm also a bit of a, a, a disciplinary uh, interloper. I'm trained in anthropology and sociology, but um, I've been a professor of social medicine in Brazil and, and uh, public health in the United States. Um, so I, I have something of a, a, a mixed bag 
in terms of my disciplinary uh, training and, and action as well. And, and those things are just givens in, in terms of my, uh, the thoughts that I'm gonna share with you today. So in terms of the first part of what I'd like to talk about, and I'm gonna try to pay attention to the time that I was given, but uh, if, the, if Beatriz or the organizers can also uh, let me know when I'm getting close to the time I should stop talking that, that way in the chat or whatever, that would be great. In the first part of this uh, presentation, I wanna talk a bit about theories of power and what I'm calling fields of power that to a certain extent uh, grow out of the theories of power. Um, and, and for me at least, there are three major theoretical perspectives that over the course of my work uh, have been useful as ways of thinking about power. Um, the, the three uh, are the notion of biopower, which is probably most closely associated uh, with the work of Michel Foucault, but also now a huge uh, number of people who have been influenced by Foucault over the years. Uh, the second, uh, the idea of political economy, uh, which is older than the notion of biopower, uh, most closely associated, I suppose, uh, in intellectual history with the work of Marx and Marxism, um, although uh, political economy is a broad field that has many contributions from different perspectives. And most recently, the idea of necropolitics associated with the work of Achille Mbembe, uh, and particularly influential in the past decade, I think, um, and, and especially uh, in times of COVID-19, uh, COVID uh, necropolitics is something that we've talked a lot about and that I've found very helpful as a way of thinking about power in global health uh, very recently. Um, let me start with biopower, even though it doesn't come historically first. Uh, it, it, ah, no, excuse me. Um, before I go into biopower, uh, after I talk about these three, uh, these three uh, theories of power, I also want to talk about uh, a couple of fields of power that they help to create and that are important for us to think about uh, the creation of concepts and methods in global health collaborations. One is the idea of, of structural violence, of, of axes of inequality and, and synergy between different axes of inequality. Uh, and the, the second is what I'm calling disciplinary or epistemological stigma, uh, discrimination and inequality uh, that exists between historically constituted inequalities in, in scientific fields. So I'll talk about fields of power momentarily, but let me start by talking a bit about the idea, uh, the three theories of power that I mentioned. The idea of biopower, I'm gonna start with even though it didn't come first, but it did come first for me in a, in a way. Um, I was a student at the University of California in Berkeley in the late 1970s and the early 1980s uh, when Michel Foucault was a, was a visiting professor on a regular basis at Berkeley. Um, and Foucault was really influential to my own thinking uh, at that point in time. And, and I started thinking about power because of Foucault and started thinking about biopower as in many ways the first area of power um, that I was interested in, in, in looking at. And biopower is a neologism, of course, the term itself uh, uh, is linked in Foucault's writings to biopolitics. Um, and, and, and basically it, it was a way for him to look at the genealogy or the historical construction of knowledge as it's related to power. And, and, and I think um, the, uh, the, the, the key insight from Foucault that is helpful to remember um, in thinking about the research uh, exercise and thinking about how we try to construct knowledge is to recognize that knowledge can never be uh, produced outside of or independent from systems of power. Uh, in, in Foucault's vision, power is sort of like a web that we're caught in all the time and there's no escaping it. There's no way to step outside of power and be able to look at it objectively or independently uh, as somehow an outsider. We're always in, in all our thoughts, in all our knowledge, we're always in the middle of power relationships. Um, and, and that issue of biopower has therefore been especially useful, I think, um, to try to think about knowledge production, to try to think about research. Uh, even though Foucault looked historically, um, he was always trying to 
uh, trying to understand what he called the history of the present. He wanted to understand how we got to where we are. And he, he wasn't actually so concerned as a historian might be with trying to uh, develop the most thorough uh, analysis that he could of a historical period. He was concerned with what the genealogy was that got us from that period to where we are today um, and how those relationships shape uh, and constrain uh, what it is we're able to do and we're able to think about today. And so that's where I kind of started in my own career thinking about power and the first things that I wrote about, which were, were was work on gender and sexuality in the the sort of the social construction of the sexual universe in Brazil, for example. But I moved to Brazil. I lived full time uh, from the mid 1980s through the late 1990s in Brazil and was a faculty member uh, at, at a Brazilian uh, university. Um, and one of the things that I very quickly came to, to recognize was that biopower uh, clearly was only part of the picture um, that uh, the historical uh, analysis of political economy and the way in which uh, economic inequalities uh, uh, and injustices organize the world um, is fundamentally important to try to understand uh, any kind of reality as well. And it certainly was important for me to try and understand the realities that I was looking at in, in Brazil and trying, trying to understand. Um, and, and I think, uh, in, in, so I, I became increasingly influenced by Marxist perspectives and by a focus on, on political economy as a complement to, to the kind of biopower analysis that I had been, uh, I had been trained in as a, as a doctoral student. Um, and, and in bringing political economy into the analysis of power, um, I think it pushes us to look at what I'd call the synergies of social and economic exclusion. Um, I don't use it here, but when I talk about synergies, the word intersectionality is certainly one of the ways in which lots of people are thinking about those synergies now, the way in which different kinds of inequalities uh, intersect and, and, and work together uh, in creating challenges for the people who uh, for, for the people who we're trying to understand. Uh, and, and, and that, uh, that political economic analysis is something that I think is also crucial and crucial to think about global health collaboration uh, and, and research because uh, economic inequality is one of the things that is part and parcel of uh, global health partnerships in, in many cases. There are geographies of inequality and injustice that it's impossible to ignore uh, if we're looking at these issues from the perspective of global health, for example. And in particular, over the course of the past two to three decades, um, the galloping increasing speed of neoliberal globalization uh, has reproduced the legacies of colonialism and imperialism in relation to knowledge production. Uh, we may be uh, past the colonial and imperial era, but neo-colonialism and neo-imperialism are still very much with us, as I'll try to explain when I move to the second part of this uh, presentation. Uh, and they influence knowledge production in profound ways that we need to worry about and, and be, be aware of and be concerned about. Then the third uh, uh, kind of theory of power that has come to be increasingly uh, influential in recent years uh, the Cameroonian uh, uh, social thinker uh, Mbembe, uh, who currently is a faculty member uh, at Wits University in, in South Africa, um, has, has coined this term in 1993 and has published a recent book uh, on necropolitics uh, and, and uh, basically brought necropolitics to bear uh, because he thought that the idea of biopower Foucault developed to, to look at the way in which power is imbued in every aspect of life um, was insufficient to be able to understand how power is used uh, in relation to death as well. Um, and, and I think necropolitics is especially useful to us in global health um, because it helps us to shift our focus from what is often described as the social and I'd say even the political determinants of health to look at the social and political determinants of, of death. Um, some people die uh, not 
because of natural causes, but because of social relations and because of social structures and because of social systems and political systems that create death, um, uh, that put some people in situations of vulnerability um, and, and that organize death in specific ways in different societies. And, and it's fundamentally important, therefore, for us to begin to think about these structures of social violence um, that affect health uh, and cause death um, and, and to shift from thinking about them in a kind of neutral way to thinking about them in ways that um, really capture the determinants uh, of, 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 of that violence. Um, it, it isn't just a question as, as social determinants of health might have us think of how power, poverty is important or how race is important or how gender is important. Um, it's for us to understand how poverty uh, is caused by economic exclusion, by action to exclude uh, certain people and populations, how racism uh, is what we need to be concerned about, not just race, um, and how gender power and oppression uh, operate uh, in, in ways that oppress some people um, and empower other people. Uh, uh, and, and so looking at that act of violence uh, is an especially important thing that I think necropolitics and the concept of necropolitics helps us to, uh, to be able to understand. And, and it's precisely because of this that the three sort of theories of power that I've just very rapidly sketched out uh, translate into what I describe as a, a number of different fields of, of power that we should be concerned about. One I've already mentioned is structural violence, um, which has axes of inequality and synergies between different axes of inequality. Um, these aren't the only axes of inequality that we might want to look at, but they're some of the big ones that are especially important. Poverty and economic exclusion, racism and ethnic discrimination, gender power oppression, sexual discrimination and oppression, and age discrimination are all axes in which structural violence operates um, in, in powerful ways. They're, they're, they play themselves out differently in different societies. Uh, some societies like the United States uh, or Brazil, um, race is the, the, the key element that uh, discrimination in relation to race and ethnicity functions in. In so other societies, they may be different. In, in uh, Thailand, it may be ethnic groups from the highlands as opposed to uh, uh, the dominant ethnic groups in the center of society. So different societies organize these details in different ways, but the sociological principles in which power operates through structural violence tends to uh, uh, function cross-culturally, cross transnationally, in all sites or settings where we might be working. There's a second aspect that I think we've thought very little about, actually, um, and that there isn't a large literature about, but it's what I'd call disciplinary and epistemological stigma discrimination and inequality, which is the fact that there, uh, there are hierarchies in research uh, and in disciplines and in epistemological frameworks uh, particularly um, in the field of global health uh, that are affected by the history of both public health and medicine. And that it's useful uh, to keep in mind because they sometimes um, rear their head in, in relation to global health research. Um, and just, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but just to give you some sense of different, um, different areas uh, and how they fit into the hierarchy. Um, we might distinguish, for example, between bench uh, or laboratory sciences, the, the basic science work such as biochemistry or microbiology um, involving uh, laboratory studies with cell cultures, animal studies or physiological experiments um, uh, from say clinical medical research, um, scientific disciplines as applied to clinical research, such as cardiology or endocrinology and so on, um, which are different from public health disciplines like epidemiology and biostatistics, um, sciences focusing on the causes and distribution of diseases and medical conditions, <coughs> and especially using mathematical or statistical analysis in relation to issues in public health and, and medicine. And finally, behavioral sciences and social sciences. Behavioral sciences 
uh, typically are sciences that study the behavior of both human beings and other animals, um, behavioral psychology, behavioral genetics, cognitive science, and that often use experimental methods such as controlled settings uh, to get their empirical outcomes. The social sciences uh, tend to be disciplines that study human actions much more than animals uh, in different social contexts like economics, political science, sociology, demography, anthropology, and psychology. The key point here is that within the field of global health and within medical sciences more generally, uh, there tends to be a hierarchy of value and power uh, in which uh, the sciences listed at the top of this list uh, tend to be seen as more scientific uh, in quotes uh, than the sciences at the bottom of the list that some uh, hard scientists actually think is not scientific at all. Um, and and the, uh, the more social sciences tend to be often stigmatized uh, as being less scientific, less empirical, um, and uh, therefore uh, less significant in terms of making decisions, informing policy, and so on, than the hard sciences are. Partly this is a, a result of the history of, of public health in relation to medicine. Public health started usually as a department in a medical school, and then was spun out over time to become a school in its own rights with with its own departments of epidemiology or of behavioral sciences or of social sciences, uh, policy research or what have you. Um, and in fact, uh, in evaluating the ranking of schools of public health in the United States, for example, only epidemiology and biostatistics are, are uh, analyzed. So the, the US News and World Report ranking of schools of public health, that schools of public health always used to say I'm number one or I'm number five or what have you, is based only on their epidemiology and biostatistics uh, programs because those are the ones that are considered to be scientific. The behavioral sciences and social sciences are seen as less scientific um, and therefore uh, in, in many ways less important within the structure of values in the economy. So in, in, the, in the academy, so, so that um, power operates in relation to uh, scientific disciplines, just as it operates in relation to social classes or genders or what have you. Um, and it's always important in research to be aware of those power relations because often we just experience them, we don't analyze them or think about them and, and therefore um, we misunderstand certain things that we might understand more effectively if we thought about uh, disciplinary and epistemological power in the same way that we think of other forms of power. Okay, so I'm uh, uh, going to have to move fairly quickly now because I've used up a, a, a significant part of my time. Let me move into the second part of this talk. Um, and again, what here, I'm gonna move very quickly because really what I just wanna get across, the point is simple. Uh, it's that global health, <clears throat> as we know it in 2022, has a very long history. It's been with us since at least the middle of the 19th century. And it's gone through a number of phases and it's had a number of different names. Uh, it was first called tropical medicine in the mid 19th century on up to the Second World War. Then it was called at the end of the Second World War with the creation of the UN and the international system, the creation of the World Health Organization in 1948 and the the International Declaration of Human Rights, also in 1948, initiated a new phase that we call the, the phase of international health that went more or less to the end of the 20th century when we started calling it global health. The first, the first um, uh, program that used the name global uh, health in its, in, its, uh, in its heading, in its title, was a program at the University of California, San Francisco, that was founded with the term global health only in 1999. So it's only 20 years, really, that global health has been the language that we've talked about. But the legacy of, of these different periods has been with us in, in profound ways that still we should be concerned about. Tropical medicine in the 19th century was fundamentally uh, made possible by initial European colonial expansion and later uh, other countries like the United States with its neo-colonial interests. Uh, it was involved with mediating the encounter between the, the West um, with the rest of the world, uh, particularly the populations in poor countries uh, in the Southern Hemisphere, 
Um, and it was structured and sustained in relation to geopolitical interests and concerns. Um, and, and that uh, legacy of geopolitics and commerce that really created tropical medicine to be created, it was originally created as a way of taking care of the Europeans who went to the tropics and encountered new diseases and new health challenges uh, and was totally unconcerned with the populations uh, of, those, of those countries. Uh, it, was, it was often implemented by, uh, by military agents um, and it was, it was funded in large part by, uh, by business, by commerce, by wealthy businessmen. All of the early schools of public health, like the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine or the Institute of Tropical Medicine in Antwerp, uh, were created by rich in the era. They were millionaires, not billionaires, but rich uh, uh, philanthropists uh, who had uh, commercial concerns in the tropics and who wanted to stimulate research, scientific understanding, medical knowledge about the diseases of the tropics as a way of confronting uh, the, the health issues that the tropics placed on the agenda. Um, it was with us up to, <coughs> up to the, the Second World War, <coughs> and in some ways is still with us today. Um, and it, it has some lasting legacies. Uh, as a kind of paradigm in, in looking at global health. Um, we need to be aware because of tropical medicine that social and political history provides a crucial context for understanding the history of public health efforts. The deployment of power and the deployment of knowledge in relation to health about in the world um, has been linked since the very beginning of the tropical medicine period. It is a new linkage. It's been with us for a long time. The geopolitical interests and conflicts uh, that play a role in shaping world health were fundamentally profound in that era of, era of colonial uh, empires. Um, with the arrival of the Second World War, with the breakup of colonial empires, many of these things began to shift. But the connections that it put in place are still with us today. Uh, as part of our historical baggage, if you will, in important ways. In the mid 20th century, at the end of the Second World War, um, with the restructuring of the world that came about as a result of, of the Second World War, um, the breakup of the colonial empires, the creation of an international system, uh, we, we find the construction of a new international order uh, and what came to be called international health uh, in, in, a, in a new way. Uh, the creation of the World Health Organization was crucial to this. The organization of nations in the United Nations uh, as a, a, a body that could allow us to confront issues of health uh, was fundamentally important. But power, as, as this uh, uh, slide with the flags of the Soviet Union and the United States in the representation, power continued to be profound and the division between the Soviet bloc and the, and the uh, capitalist bloc uh, led by the USA uh, uh, and the Cold War between those, uh, those forces that dominated the second half of the 20th century uh, was fundamentally important in terms of developing international health, as was the creation of this new international system um, uh, with some older uh, uh, institutions like the Rockefeller Foundation since 1913 um, playing an important role, but with many new UN organizations playing a role with the, the WHO in the lead role, um, but with every UN program basically having something to do with health in, in different ways over the second half of the 20th century. It was that system um, that left us with a new set of legacies. Uh, it was during this period that cross-national and comparative international health research uh, was basically created. The kind of comparative uh, work, a project uh, like the project that many of you were involved in uh, with multi-sites in different countries um, it is something that was a creation of the international health paradigm. Um, and, and it was also a period when um, the, the linkage between power and, and knowledge became 
uh, closely linked to the idea of development and to notions of, of who was developed and who was underdeveloped. What were the developed countries? What were the underdeveloped countries? How could you turn underdeveloped places into developed places with all of the hierarchical assumptions um, that that assu uh, assumes uh, it, it was elaborated during this period. Um, and it was a period when ge geopolitical interests and conflicts continued to play a key role um, often shaping funding and, and other kinds of issues in profound ways, but quite differently than was the case uh, in tropical medicine. So that was sort of the second historical layer that we have leading up to global health. Uh, uh, global health uh, starts to move to the end, starts to move in to replace international health at the end of the 20th century and as we move into the 21st century. We had a changing world order uh, with the end of the Cold War in the late 1980s, uh, and then a kind of period of reckoning with that during the 1990s. Um, and, and we had a, a profound rethinking of security uh, after the Cold War, but then again after 9-11 in 2001. Uh, HIV AIDS, uh, a field that I've worked in for 40 years basically, played a pivotal role here <coughs> and helped to create what in about 2000, we began calling global health. And we started to, to roll out global health initiatives, first to respond to HIV and AIDS, uh, but then to deal with a range of other uh, kinds of issues over the course of the past two decades. Uh, the broader political economic context of the field of global health has, has also been uh, important. Uh, globalized capitalism is the only game in town after the Soviet Union essentially broke up and the, the other so-called socialist countries integrated into global markets. Uh, uh, global capitalism became the only game in town. Neoliberal policy linked to the interests of global capitalism uh, dominated uh, uh, international development thinking uh, and dominated the field of, of global health. And, and, and the idea of the global governance of health as something similar to what existed in the time of international health, but uh, even more driven by uh, notions of globalization and the need to create multiple forms of governance that wouldn't just be related to uh, individual country governments, but to structures of governance that would involve a range of different players. In the period of global health, we've had a new emphasis on private resources and public-private partnerships coming to, to the fore. And in some ways, it's almost like we're going full circle because today we live in a world in which the biggest donor to the World Health Organization may not be an individual country or countries, uh, but private uh, philanthropy like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Uh, so just like in the time of tropical medicine, wealthy individuals uh, become much more important in the period of global health than they were actually during the period of international health. And public-private uh, partnerships, PPPs like Drugs for Neglected Disease Initiative or Gavi or the Global Fund um, are, are examples of key institutions that structure the field of global health as we work with it today. Now, the key point of all this is not, I mean, this I could go on at length about it, but it's not to, uh, uh, to, to go into too many historical details. Uh, it's for us to remember that these legacies are there. Um, we need to be aware of the fact that we're working in systems that reproduce relations of power um, and link power to systems of meaning. Um, we need to be aware uh, of, of the fact that research uh, is related to other activities in a system of, of, of uh, power uh, that's linked to the pr production of knowledge. And we need to think about these things critically and collectively um, to be able to, uh, uh, to, be able to, uh, to, to reflect on them and, and to work for greater equity and justice in, in terms of research partnerships. So let me, let me end up um, by talking uh, quickly about that last part of the, of the equation then, how to seek equity and justice in global health research partnerships in a world that is so uh, unequal um, and so, uh, so driven by power inequalities in, in different ways. My argument would be that it's not impossible, but that it's certainly an uphill 
battle. Um, and probably we're never able to achieve the level of equity and justice that we strive for. But if we don't strive for it, we'll never achieve more than we currently have. Um, I think uh, that it's important here to recognize that there are different kinds of global health research. I won't talk about all of these because of time, um, but I'll say that um, I, I'm really focusing on the last two items here, health policies and systems research and social and behavioral research, because I think they're the most closely linked um, to what most of you who are participating in, 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 this, uh, in this seminar are, are involved in. Um, and so my, my reflections will be largely on these, um, which almost always in global health involve partnerships in some way or another. It, it really is no longer acceptable um, for researchers to parachute in uh, to a setting in the global south and carry out research without having partners to work with um, uh, because it's, it's far too imperialistic uh, for any of us to be able to, to tolerate. So research partnerships are the way in which global health most typically, uh, most typically operates. Um, global health research uh, partnerships in these areas are almost always involved field research um, they typically involve theoretical framing that draws on multiple theoretical and interpretive frameworks and traditions, although I want to say more about that because um, they don't always draw on as many theoretical and interpretive traditions as I think they ought to. Um, research teams are typically not only transnational, but also inter- or multidisciplinary. Um, they often involve people from multiple different social science, behavioral, and policy research disciplines. Um, precisely because of this issues of diversity and difference in perspectives and backgrounds and epistemologies are almost uh, an inevitable given in this kind of research. Building more equitable, equitable partnerships, in my view, depends on uh, elaborating both principles and strategies. Equity and justice don't just happen naturally. Um, we really have to work for them because if we don't make a conscious effort um, we won't come anywhere close. Um, so we have to be reflexive. We have to think about power relations and we have to think about what in many social sciences is called positionality, um, where those of us who do the research are positioned, how we're positioned uh, in, in relation to uh, research subjects, how we're positioned in relation to one another on an interdisciplinary research team. Uh, these are essential uh, issues. They're not just uh, window dressing. And we need to uh, strive for consciousness raising. It's an English translation of the Portuguese term uh, that the uh, pedagogical theorist Paulo Freire described as conscientização. Uh, it's not a totally adequate translation for the richness of Freire's term, um, but it, it, it's at least a start. Um, and, and consciousness raising about issues of power and equity in research collaborations, in research concepts, in research methods uh, is, a, is an ongoing process that we need to stimulate. Some recommendations of my own in, based on 40 years of experience uh, is to, to understand the historical legacies of power inequalities. They're always with us and they require ongoing re deconstruction. Um, also to seek to build long-term collaborations and partnerships because it's one of the ways in which I think we, we can over time gradually build greater equity. To structure partnerships prior to designing projects or looking for funding um, and to seek to nurture what I'd call epistemic justice and theoretical diversity. Let me talk just a little bit about each one of these and then I'll, I'll, I'll try to stop. Um, first, building long-term collaborations. Research collaboration is a social process. It can be supportive um, or not, uh, depending on how we, we approach it. Um, it. It doesn't just happen naturally. Again, it needs, you need to work at it. Um, and, and I found it especially useful um, to try to establish and nurture long-term collaborative relationships. Uh, a one-off project is not a good base for uh, collaborative equity. Long-term research collaborations involving multiple projects have for me been the best way of constructing uh, something that feels just. Um, you have to be aware that long-term collaborations can grow out of a single project 
Um, but it's, it's probably more rare than we would like. Too much global health research is a one-off deal um, that doesn't go very well and then doesn't get corrected over time. Uh, more frequently, long-term collaborations require institutional architectures that are capable of supporting, reinforcing, and strengthening collective relationships. So it's not just individual investigators, it's institutions that invest in building contexts in which investigators can collaborate um, and build that up over time that I think has the most chance of success. Uh, my, my recommendation to structure partnerships prior to projects is that often partnerships get created after, after a decision to pursue a, a particular study or a particular funding opportunity. And sometimes this works, but often it doesn't. Um, and it can stimulate diverse forms of inequality uh, in terms of the interaction between investigators from North and South, from different countries, and different disciplines and whatnot, for all of the reasons that I've talked about already. Building long-term partnerships and then deciding what projects to develop together and what sources of funding to pursue, uh, I found can help build greater equity uh, among the members of a research collaboration. This is a really important one that hopefully we'll have more time to talk about in discussion than I have time to, to do here to uh, stay on time. Seeking to nurture epistemic justice um, and, and theoretical diversity. Um, we have to recognize that theory matters, but the theory is neutral. Um, and that uh, epistemology is also about power and often about epistemicide. Um, we need to uh, recognize the importance of, of Southern theory uh, as Raywin Connell uh, uh, described it in her uh, 2007 book, uh, Southern Theory on the importance of theoretical perspectives from the global South. Um, and bring Southern theory into research design as much as possible. We also have to recognize what Boaventura de Sousa Santos, the Portuguese sociologist, has analyzed as cognitive injustice um, and, and the way in which Northern epistemologies often make the epistemologies uh, of the South uh, disappear uh, or treat them as illegitimate and unimportant. Um, and try to bring in epistemologies from the South uh, as part of the conceptualization of research design and implementation. Um, and we need to resist what Boaventura describes as the wasting of experience, throwing out all of the things that we've learned as we start a new project and begin to create the wheel all over again. Um, there's a lot here to unpack and I don't have the time um, to do that, I'm afraid. Um, I, I have some examples of collaborative projects that I was involved in that if I had more time, I would go into in greater detail. Uh, but since I, I'm over time already, I'll just list them and, and maybe I'll bring in some examples in the discussion if they prove to be relevant. Um, I, I've often looked for models to feminist research. Um, and one of the great feminist studies that I'm particularly uh, indebted to for helping me to think about my own research undertaking. This is the International Reproductive Rights Research Action Group, um, IRAG. Um, uh, and, and so that was one of the studies I was going to talk about. I was also going to talk about a multi-sided study of religious responses to AIDS in Brazil um, that I developed with my Brazilian colleagues from uh, four different uh, universities and, and uh, uh, non-governmental organizations. And then I was going to talk about uh, a study that uh, in Sexuality Policy Watch, we've developed sex politics reports from the front lines, uh, comparative case studies on, on research related to sexual and reproductive health and rights um, that uh, uh, we've developed in, in ways that I think help uh, to develop more collaborative conceptual uh, work. And, and I can bring those examples in in more detail when we open the discussion up. I was going to do that here um, uh, quickly, but I don't really have the time to do that. So I'll, I'll stop here. Thank you for your uh, patience uh, and uh, hand over to the uh, coordinators of the, uh, of the, I have to just get myself out of this uh, screen sharing mode so that stop share. Okay, so that you can go back to the full screen. Voila, there we are. Richard, thank you so much for your presentation. It was really interesting. I think we all learned a lot. Um, now I'll ask Dr. Poonan 
to speak. Uh, Dr. Poonan Richel is a medical doctor, a co-investigator of the Healthcare Response to Violence and Abuse Research Study in Dulikan Hospital, Nepal. She is a mixed method researcher and has been involved in innovative, collaborative, and multi-country researches in violence against women in Norway, Sweden, England, Sri Lanka, Brazil, and Palestine. She has a long experience working in gender. Most of her work applies a transformative and co-designing approach to response and prevention program with user groups as well as stakeholders of gender-based violence. Apart from research, she has been acknowledged as an expert in the field as an advisor by NGOs, INGOs, WHO, Prevention Collaborative, and Ministry in Nepal. Um, Dr. Poonan. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, um, everyone, and especially thanks to Richard, who has made my uh, you know, presentation very easy because I don't have to go through theories and, and, and which, is, which is a lot of pain, actually. You know, when it comes to talking about power and power dynamics and global, global partnership. Um, yeah, coming from, uh, I think today I'll just bring in some examples of researches that I have been involved in and, and you know, how um, this power dynamics has transitioned from being, uh, you know, from being uh, colonized to decolonized in different projects that I've worked. So, um, so uh, actually, you know, in Nepal, um, in Nepal also, uh, like any other places, um, it started with tropical medicine as, as the entry point, and, and it was definitely geopolitics, but as well as, you know, religious um, religion as well. So uh, there were lots of, it, it is said, like, I don't know, because, you know, like, we are very poor in documenting it in terms of um, um, a scientific publication, but then, you know, uh, the the researchers that I have worked with previously, you know, my senior uh, colleagues, uh, they 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 said that you know the entry point uh, of you know this uh, research projects or any program in Nepal entered as something like you know spread of Christianity in a way, uh, and and you know so so there was even a rule that like if anyone was found you know any if any foreign doctors or any researchers were found to talk about Christianity, then they were also put in jail uh, by the you know, government of Nepal. So it was, there was this policy then, uh, you know, when in the olden days. So it started from there. And then most of the years, you know, it remained as a, it remained as um, a colonial, um, you know, colonial uh, part. Um, like for instance, you know, like, uh, the, the, the WHO or, or any other organization, the, especially the funder, uh, you know, agencies, you know, they, they, they took hold of the power right from decision making. So we weren't even allowed to think about, you know, um, it autonomously about, you know, what the problem is, you know, where do we want to take this research further, you know, so, so there was nothing as, um, you know, anything such as uh, co-designing or co-creating uh, research or scientific or scientific um, you know production of knowledge and and either and and even till now you know it is more like eurocentric uh, or or you know funder driven but uh, but in recent um, uh, funder driven in terms of you know uh, something like in 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 one of the collaborations that I've worked with it's more like you know testing a foreigner a foreign, like for let's say, instrument in a Nepali context, and and it's not even a proper validation of the study or proper instrument, a proper validation of the in instrument from the user's perspective, or from the stakeholders' perspective. But it, it's just like you are testing or you know measuring things uh, from the perspective of um, from the from the tools that have been used abroad. So, you know, even in terms of defining the problem, like for ex example, you know, I've been working in, uh, on issues related to uh, research and issues related to gender-based violence and, and even like measuring violence uh, in, in, in a low a middle income country where the status of women is still, you know, like they're, they're only 51%, um, the, the education is only 51%. Um, even in those areas, um, you know, if we bring international instrument, the knowledge, 
from there and then try to measure violence among women in Nepal, it, it's not going to work because we do not know what, as, as Richard was saying, like, you know, we haven't really challenged the theories. You know, we haven't really, you know, we haven't really tried to explore what women in Nepal think violence is, you know? So we are bringing on those, uh, those uh, tools and techniques to, 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 to see that. And then, you know, and then only placing, like, even when I started my master's degree, you know, I started measuring intimate partner violence. And only after, you know, I went to the field, I started, uh, you know, with the questionnaire, then I felt that, you know, violence is something that, that intimate partner was, not, you know, um, you know, we, nobody had looked into intimate partner violence and it was the first time and I could have started with qualitative methods, but then, you know, but then qualitative method till now in Nepal is not really established as a method of its own. So there, there's no paradigm shift in also thinking about uses of different methodologies um, uh, within, within the research area. And it is something that has been Qualitative method is something that has been used uh, by the sociologist, anthropologist, and then it doesn't really, you know, appeal people because, uh, you know, people are still confused. How can we even interpret words? Because interpreting numbers is concrete as, as per their own understanding. So, you know, this paradigm has not shifted, but then, uh, but then, you know, this decolonization has also, decolonization of knowledge mobilization has in fact, done a, a, a better, you know, a better understanding has brought a better understanding in terms of, you know, qualitative research methods. So, uh, so in, even within health system, you know, we are using qualitative methods to understand, understand the, the, the for example, the determinants of you know, what, what, what causes, you know, adverse effects on health, for example. So even like not only in um, not only in gender researches, but even researches in tuberculosis, where I'm a part of, you know, uh, the project. Now we have started doing this. Um... Okay, yeah, and then we have started, you know, looking into the gender perspective of tuberculosis and why, you know, why there is um, uh, discrepancy between. Uh, men and women or or you know why women do not adhere to the medication so so these are the perspectives that we are bringing and and uh, i'm i'm sure this is because of decolonization of uh, you know knowledge and knowledge mobilization um and and also because of exposure because now we are you know exposed to uh, the um, the 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 uh, you know developed countries and, and we have education from there. So now we are bringing in this decolonization to the country uh, as well. And then, you know, we are trying to shifting pa shift paradigms uh, as well in, in scientific production of scientific knowledge in that sense. So, <clears throat> so that is something uh, there. And, and in olden days, um, you know, as per my senior colleagues again, you know, they, they really felt that, you know, uh, the the knowledge that they generated was, um, you know, something that was of interest only for funding. But now, you know, now, uh, like in my time, I think now we have al already moved into, you know, uh, mobilizing knowledge in terms of developing theories in, in, in the LMIC context. And we are, we are striving for, you know, this epistemic justice. And, and we are also bringing in um, you know, uh, personal experiences of people. So I think in that sense, there is a lot of decolonization happening in, in this era, in this modern uh, era um, in, in LMIC country as well. So, so I think, um, you know, keeping aside all this colonization which still exists and we're not really there, um, the, the, the project that uh, we are working with Brazil, Sri Lanka, Palestine, and Nepal and um, London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and University of Bristol, you know, uh, which we call as HERA, healthcare responding to uh, violence and abuse, is a good example of, you know, decolonization of um, knowledge mobilization, uh, where, you know, where, 
there, which uh, be, where the learning partnership is based on transparency, you know, um, uh, also you know hierarchies, uh, which is non-hierarchical, and it's not like you know I'm I, I have never felt uh, that I I'm not being you know my voice is not heard. So so in that sense, you know, it is equitable and and <clears throat> mostly you know um, right from the start, I think right from the start, even. Uh, before we got the fund, right from writing the protocol, you know, the, the uh, PIs, now the PIs, but the partners, you know, partners in every country were consulted, you know, we were consulted about what the problem is and, and where do we want to take our research. So, so we, we had to write, you know, um, the problem statement and, and the protocol on the whole was based on the problem identified. And then, you know, how do we bring these, um, you know, problems together? And, and the other thing that was uh, very welcomed was, uh, you know, um, welcomed was the theoretical challenge that we were giving to the concepts of violence, you know, the, the, eco, the challenge to ecocentric models that, that we were, you know, talking about, that was welcomed. And each country was autonomous to decide about what what is the problem that we wanted to address to to really you know to that would really complement <clears throat> the overarching aim of healthcare responding to violence and abuse and you know in the middle of the project you know we started after our formative period we realized that it was not only the healthcare <clears throat> you know where we needed intervention but then there was this community structure so and then it was like, you know, we were all open and we respected uh, the different aspects that we wanted to take, uh, you know, with our project. So, so you know, in, in, a, in a way, you know, we were not only restricted to, okay, so maybe, you know, identification is a good way, but then, you know, we were discussing about things and in, in our monthly meetings, you know, or, or whenever we need, we discuss about, you know, what would be a locally adapted and modified model or what new could we add, can we add so you know uh, so this hera 2 is is a is a good example of you know uh, decolonization of knowledge mobilization and 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 from this you know um, we went on further to write another protocol because we wanted to you know um, you know as as richard said like long term collaboration so we wanted to foster and nurture this long-term collaboration. And then, you know, we started with the point of epistemic justice, uh, you know, of interventions to reduce violence against women. And then even in the leadership, you know, um, I coming from, an, from a low-income country, I was given this, uh, you know, opportunity to, to, to lead this, uh, to become a leader, uh, you know, um, a leader of the project and represent LMIC country. And then there was another one from the other country. I think it was from Brazil. Anna was the other leader. So, you know, there was this transformation of leadership also happening. Um, and, and it wasn't only concentrated to our collaborators in the UK. So, so this is also a good example of, you know, how we are thinking about not just um, decolonization of knowledge, but also, you know, um, um, decolonization or transformation of leadership as well in the field of you know violence against women and and all those things so so this, this is another point and 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 we were not restricted and then we uh, even within the group we have you know people from um, sociology anthropology we have people from health public health you know so it, it and then we and mostly you know in in one of the uh, research group that I worked in, uh, it was only, you know, the, the domain of violence against women, the research domain on violence against women was always seen as, uh, you know, has to be led by women. But in this group, we all we have also welcomed, you know, uh, men, and we have also engaged men within our group. So, which is also, you know, like trying to address the different intersectionality within the group. So, um, but, but even then, you know, but there is this, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't call it colonization, but then the, the power the funders play, you know, to, um, to identify uh, 
you know, the problem or, or, uh, or prioritize the problem, you know, there is this whole set of power from the funders level, you know, uh, where, where we didn't receive the protocol in the first place, and then now we're trying for second round. So, so there are other powers, you know, the, in the structure that, that really restricts uh, works like these. So I think in a nutshell, I would say that, uh, you know, Hera is a good example of, uh, I, I'm sure my other colleagues will agree to that, that it is a representation of how, you know, decolonization is welcomed and, you know, how we're practicing decolonization and also accepting intersectionality, you know, respecting the cultural practices, for instance, you know, uh, even within Hera, the, the study that we are now, uh, doing, you know, I was more keen to explore, um, for example, violence against LGBTI community as well, in the context of Nepal. But you know, but uh, and but then it was really, um, I think it was a, a sort of taboo identified as taboo in Bra for Brazil and I think also for Palestine and Sri Lanka. So so you know how we accommodate those how we accommodated and accepted and respected, you know, the cultural, um, the cultural norms and uh, even within the group, uh, you know, that is also, you know, something about, you know, how we, uh, how we are exercising the power and how we are not overpowering, uh, you know, the other country or, or overpowering just Nepal because we are, you know, we are uh, defined as a low income country in that sense. So, so I think um, this, is, this is just an example of what Richard has already explained in his theory. And, and uh, I think I'm open for discussion or any question and answer. I, I think I'll stop here. Thank you so much, everyone. And thank you, Richard. So much. I think it was such an interesting combination having Richard um, coming first and then you telling us about all those different experiences that sort of illustrated and brought. You can hear me. Yeah, your vo volume is so low. Can you hear me now? Yes. <laughs> Um, so thank you so much. I think this was such an interesting combination of having Richard's presentation and then you, yours, and then you talking about your experience that illustrated a lot. So I think that was a very rich combination. I was wondering if um, we should go back to Richard. Maybe now he would like to comment before we go um, open for questions and then maybe maybe finish or give the examples that he would. Mm. Now you're muted. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, the examples that I was going to was going to give were just three examples of of research projects that uh, have been comparative and and have involved uh, multiple teams from different countries, like the work that is being done uh, in in your projects, um, and and that I think offer some insights into the way in which this can be can be built. And uh, uh, Punam has already, in, in many ways, described some of the processes that those projects illustrated for, for me. The, the IREG project um, was an example of a multi-site study uh, that, that required a long process in which the investigators worked together to create the, uh, the frames for sampling, the way in which they would decide on the questions that could be used in different sites, um, and that was, I, I think, a, a good example um, also of, of a, a situation in which it was a, a northern funded project, as projects often are, but where uh, the investigators worked hard to, not, to make it not a northern dominated uh, kind of intellectual agenda. And I, I think that's the real, the real challenge, because in global health research, so often funding comes from the global north. It comes from often... Um, agencies like the National Institutes of Health or other governmental agencies that um, are, are more, uh, they, they're dominated by biomedical, uh, uh, the biomedical hierarchies that I, I described and, and often the, the kind of more um, horizontal 
but power relations that, that I think we would like to create in our own research don't fully make sense to the funding agencies themselves. So it becomes hard to, uh, to not reproduce hierarchies um, from, from the point of departure, the get-go of the funding of a, of a project. Um, and I think ERAG was a, a great example of how that could be done differently. Um, the, uh, the example of what we did in religious responses in Brazil was not multi-country, multi it was one country, but it was a multi-site project with five different sites in the same country and with different investigator groups in, in each different site. Um, the thing there that was, I think, unusual, um, probably rarely you have a chance to do that, but all of the investigators in that project had worked together um, in academic training so that uh, two of them, no, three of them uh, were, were, had been my uh, doctoral students and had done their doctoral dissertations with me as they're what we call in, in Brazil, we call the orienter. We don't call it the advisor, but the person who sort of orients the, uh, the work of, of a doctoral student. And then two of them were uh, MacArthur Foundation fellows who I had been assigned as a mentor to. Um, and then they had multiple relationships with one another so that um, two of them had been uh, postdoctoral fellows of, of, of the other uh, investigators. Those kinds of mentoring relationships over time, um, I found to be extremely helpful in creating situations of greater, uh, greater equity in terms of, of the way in which different investigators, because you, if you build up 10, 15 years of a relationship with somebody, um, usually you do that um, in, in a way that respects the, the uh, mutually respects the, the different, uh, different partners. In, and, and so that was um, a, a second thing. This, this happened to be probably, it was the largest project we did together, but it was probably the fifth or sixth project that we had done together. So long-term partnerships, it seems to me, can be very helpful ways of, of doing that. And then my last example, um, again, was going to be a multi-site study similar um, to what, what you're working on. Uh, and I was gonna talk a little bit about how we had a series of meetings over two years actually to develop the research design for that in a way that different sites could adopt three aspects of a list of about nine different topical areas that they would look at. So it was in each different site, the study was different but they were still comparative because they used the same grid of, of theoretical issues and empirical uh, questions that, that were going to be used in the different sites. So there are ways of doing comparisons that don't force everybody into exactly the same mold. Uh, and, and I think that's uh, another, another modality that is worth uh, worth exploring as, as something particularly interesting because one of the problems of big comparative projects is sometimes that the, the individual case studies can feel like they're sort of forced to follow an overarching design that's determined uh, more hierarchically and winds up, winds up often just reproducing the kind of neo-colonial um, structure that I think all of us would like to try to overcome. Um, so that was the, the all I was going to try to do with those those examples. And I think we can open up for uh, comments and, and questions and anything that anyone would like to um, would like to add in. Yeah. No. I I just wanted to add that you know even within the projects that we are doing, you know, with um, where we're trying to decolonize all this knowledge mobilization, as well as transformation, you know, as well as creating leaders in future in science, you know, we are also, you know, mentoring PhD students, you know, we're opening places for these uh, postdoctoral positions, you know, so, um, so that is also, and then, and then even like this, you know, early career research, is also a sort of, you know, an example of decolonization of uh, knowledge, you know, and not keeping our knowledge just to ourselves, but then also, you know, having this platform where even the early career researchers could learn from the senior colleagues and then in a non-hierarchical way, you know, with, with our own experiences. And also we are also, you know, learning. So we are not in a position of a teacher, rather a facilitator who, you know, who on the basis of our own experiences, we are we're mobilizing our learning 
outcomes and as well as learning from them, you know, without any hierarchy or any power, you know, ruling over power. You know, so, so I think this is also an example of, of uh, this. have two questions. Um, they're both anonymous. So I'll read the first one. As a researcher from a country in the global south that has a long colonial past, it seems reductionist and even superficial sometimes when the term decolonization is freely used in academia to refer to approaches currently used to either include local partners slash academics in research, um, who are often speaking privileged sects of the society, um, who are also English-speaking privileged sites of the society. More often than not, even in the above situation, the big decisions in relation to funding, data storage, ownership of data and publication remain with institutions in the West. What are your views on this? How can we navigate such challenges? So whoever wants to go first. No, you want to start, or do you? Well, I think no. I I think you can uh, you can start, and I can just uh, yeah compliment. Okay, I, I mean you know it's abs you're absolutely right. It, it, you know um, it, the and actually uh, I have a, a particular um, a particular irritation with much of the well I think it's well intended much of the discourse currently uh, critiquing. Uh, colonial, the colonial, neo-colonial nature of global health um, is emerging, for example, on U.S. college campuses, often by um, students from the, the South or, or from uh, minority populations in the global North. Um, but I think the critique of colonialism fundamentally needs to come from the South um, and only will succeed uh, to the extent that we transform the field of global health in a way that takes southern views into greater into greater um, account uh, you, you know the, the northern let me be all right let me be very very brutally clear my sense is that global health when we started using the new terminology many of us thought was going to be a new era in which we would truly understand, the global as global. Um, and we would restructure the field in ways that uh, overcame the power hierarchies that had characterized international health and were worse still in tropical medicine. My belief 20 years in is that we failed to do that. Um, and, and I, you know, I mean, I, I think um, it was already obvious before COVID-19, but COVID-19 has unmasked all of the failures that the field of global health has had. Um, I was much more optimistic in the mid 2000s uh, when you know, some Southern countries, Brazil was one of them, but not the only one, South Africa, a number of, of countries from the South really began to um, exert influence in, in global health in new positive ways. Um, and, and I was much more positive that that might be a continuing trend. But over the course of the 2010s, and especially after the 2007 global financial crisis, all of the worst tendencies in global health, in my view, were reconfirmed and very little progress was made in terms of reinventing the field. I think unless we, we uh, undergo a, a radical change, um, we, we, we really won't uh, move very far uh, ahead. And so uh, I wish I could be more optimistic in responding to your question about how we do this, uh, but it's, it's, it's not something I see happening right now in the field in general. I think um, we do have possibilities for making change in our own little neck of the woods or in our own, our own project, our own spot, our own institution. Um, but right now we're further from the goal of decolonization than I think we were 20 years ago. Personally, and, and in fact, I have to say my own view is that maybe we were doing better during the period that was called international health when at least uh, country governments in the international system were, were making the decisions rather than rich billionaires, uh, almost all from uh, Silicon Valley. 
Uh, and, and so uh, I, I think we've gone backward in the past 20 years. I don't think we've gone forward. And, and, and I think um, that moving forward will require a radical rethinking um, and a radical new commitment of uh, governments and countries from the global south uh, to demand uh, uh, decision-making power in a way that currently doesn't exist in the international system as it's currently configured. And uh, yeah, I would just like to add, you know, to, to what Richard said, uh, that international health was much better because it really, you know, it really um, promoted uh, health systems research, you know, rather than just, uh, you know, research on just health disease or, or social determinants and disease, you know, so it was more where we involve, where we would involve the system and then as, as, as we, you know, in every research, even in global health, you know, we think about the structural changes or systemic changes or systemic readiness to, to change certain problem is so important. So in that context, you know, and then, and because of that, you know, um, because of that, we always have to rely on funders because then we cannot, you know, develop cost-effective, you know, uh, interventions that even a country, you know, like, even an LMIC country can fund their own research. So, you know, so, so the culture is not really uh, promoted when we think of only global health, rather, you know, international health was the key because I myself, you know, having done like a master's in philosophy in international community health, and then, you know, PhD in public health, I can see the difference, you know, like for in public health and global health, we're only focused on finding out the solution, but then solution for what? solution for advocating that to the health systems to change and incorporate such findings. So, so in that case, I, I, I really agree, you know, with Richard and, and maybe we're, we're becoming more regressive than just progressive in that sense. And, and um, yeah, and then about the data storage and ownership, most of the ethical committee, I think there has been a change in, in this thinking line, you know, uh, in, in, in some of the projects and even Hera, you know, we are keeping the data as our own, you know, we have the ownership to data and even the ethical committees, like since the Research Council of Norway, you know, um, they, they do not have any problem with any of the ethical consideration when, you know, the data is owned by the, 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 the country, you know, the LMIC country, so to speak, for now. Uh, or, or not in the West, but in the East, you know. So, so they are they are fine. So there has been some sort of, you know, transformation and change in thinking in that terms, where we are made accountable for our own data, and then we can choose to, you know, how to share the data with our uh, colleagues in the West. Although we we do really need that, and 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 now, you know, even in um, in the, in the next step of Hera, what we were thinking was that, you know. We were only trying to uh, challenge the Eurocentric models, but then, you know, we also we as as a we uh, at, at least I coming from Nepal, you know, I also wanted to know the the process of change in the Western world as well when it comes to gender based. You know, there are gen there are cases of gender based violence globally, and and you know the other uh, the 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 developed countries are not untouched by those problem so there is that problem so so you know i think even us you know we have to really see because you know e even like in policies they haven't really made changes in the uk as well so so when we when actually i brought this topic out that you know we also want to know what's happening in the global south because oftentimes even like colleagues in the you know like in in the developed countries they don't really have budget to research in their own country so all the budget goes to LMIC. So decolonization has to be, you know, both ways and not even we coming from LMIC, we should not say, say that you know, funding should come to us only. But then there are so many pitfalls that even, you know, um, our colleagues in the UK has to, you know, do more research to find out what's happening in the in the process and policy. So, but global health does not allow all these, you know, things to think, even to our colleagues from the UK, whereas international health would have, I think, that is thing, but but then also, you know, like publication ruled uh, by English speaking, I, I do feel that, you know, there has not been any changes, but at least I see, you know, that in Brazil, you have articles in Portuguese or, you know, in your own language, and in Nepal, we don't 
have that. So we have to really, um, you know, build interest and develop interest for our foreign, uh, you know, for our global participants and uh, scientific world as well. So which is still, you know, I would say uh, colonization in terms of publication and knowledge mobilization. Yeah. I can't hear you, Beatrice. You're muted now. Uh, you're unmuted, but it's very, the sound is very, very low. I, I'll turn it up to see if. Um, okay, I'll speak very loudly. Man, you're, man, you're um, yeah, we have two other questions. I'll first, um, I'll read the one that sort of linked to what you were already discussing. That is, it's also an anonymous question. I think what also matters is the people in power with wealth and resources realize why this radical change in the way global health works is needed. What do you think can be done to get the governments to take action? It, it's a good question and, and I don't have a good answer, unfortunately. Um, I, I mean, the first thing, it, it sounds almost uh, obvious, but a lot is about politics. Um, we do better uh, when progressive governments are in place, um, both in countries in the South and countries in the North. Um, and, and we do much worse uh, when, you know, I, I mean, the last decade in the world has been a, a decade of, of I think moving backward, um, populist governments around the world have, have spouted up. Uh, in Brazil, for example, where after 20, almost 25 years of relatively progressive governments, even, even the center governments were relatively progressive. Um, uh, you know, we had uh, the election of a radical right wing uh, presidency, and, and that happened in many, many different countries. And you look at the United States under Donald Trump and, and the Republicans and, and the, the, the kinds of policies they pursued. Um, finally, in the United States, with a Democratic president sort of center left, you have a change in the policy in relation to intellectual property rights uh, affecting uh, vaccine access and affecting other kinds of things. So, so the, it, it sounds stupid, but politics is crucial. If you have reactionary political people in power, um, you have a harder time than if you, so, so the first thing to do is to spend, spend your time, if you're in a, a rich country, spend your time working to change your government so that you can at least begin to implement um, policies that are more uh, insightful uh, in terms of the kind of world that we need to build to make global health a, a reality. So that's part of it. Um, but part of it is also about a paradigm shift and about the way we view the world and about the way we understand difference and, 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 and whatnot. That depends on all of us. I mean, all of us are, are part of that um, uh, effort, I think, and, and uh, it, it means transforming our academic institutions. It means uh, working to make a different kind of institutional climate. There's no magic, there's no magic bullet. There's no magic solution. Um, and and it's, it's not a question of, um, you know, tomorrow we're gonna have a revolution and everything is gonna be fine. That's not gonna happen. It's slow change, but it's working with principles of equity and principles of rights and justice as the principles that we seek to strive for um, and, and, and working in every context that we can to try and make those changes. It will not happen quickly. It will not happen overnight, but I'd really like to see us stop going backwards. I think that's my, my current uh, biggest priority um, is to, to work to try to resist the backward flow 
um, mm. to try to get rid of the most oppressive political uh, leaders, policies, and 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 uh, platforms that we possibly can, um, and with a point of departure that's more progressive to begin to start thinking about changes we can we can make. Um, I'm going to stop talking, and, and go, I, I have a dog who's uh, currently in crisis. So I mean, I'll be I'll be here. Yeah. No, and, and I think, uh, yeah, um, so Risa, uh, Richard has already, you know, uh, spoken on the perspective from the, from, from, from the funders, I think from the funders point or the government in US, but, but I think, um, you know, what we as scientists or researchers, we also think that, you know, interventions should be very innovative. And for that innovation, you know, we, we do not really think about cost-effective interventions, even in our part of the world, where where we can make our government, you know, accountable for it. And if we only, you know, bring them, uh, you know, <laughs> bring them problems and and no solutions that they can take over and just drown in this, you know, global politics or or even like national politics of power and politics of poverty and so many things, you know, and politics is everywhere. So. Instead of that, if we just think about, you know, things that we can do locally, that we can make our governments, you know, accountable is also something that we need to think from our own perspective as well. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so, so to me, you know, like anyone who is funding, you know, anyone in the giving, at the giving end is always considered powerful. And they will try to, you know, they will try to, uh, you know, uh, oh, they they will try to you know have their power over us so so why don't we even as you know researchers in LMIC country you know work around innovation for cost effective researches or cost cost effective interventions rather than because for us you know innovation would mean like maybe you know there is this organization who just brought you know doing research on tuberculosis who just had this drone you know <laughs> drone from UK funded by the UK government and then they were you know and 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 they were like just you know um, taking those drones to collect sample and get it to the lab and and I was like okay so is this sustainable you know why don't we rather try to focus on human-centric experiments or human-centric design and be more humanistic and focus on human uh, so, so, the, so that would be something that you know. That would be my, um, you know, response to to this question. Thank you very much. Can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, perfect. Um, I'll go back to the first question, uh, Dr. Kuna. I think this one is for you. Um, you had mentioned that members from lower middle income countries were equally engaged in the project slash research. Um, were all these representatives from more academic, professional, or medical backgrounds, or were community members also equally involved in the process from the beginning? Yeah, um, yeah. Just to start the collaboration, it was just us because you know, for the collaboration, we do not really directly go to the the community. For instance, because it was also a, a extended collaboration from some other collaboration that we were involved in. But then uh, the two, because I, 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 I'm more of a medical, you know, um, uh, you know, I have this medical degree and then the other PI has a nursing and midwifery degree. So, but then we, we both have PhD in public health, but we come from different backgrounds into that. So, so in the beginning, it was us, but then in our research design, you know, we proposed that we should uh, have some time for the formative research where we should interview women of what they want, you know, we should uh, look at the community, the provider. So, so we did, you know, we did spend a lot of time in formative, you know, designing our intervention and in the formative phase and, and after the formative phase, you know, just interviewing them, the key informant stakeholders, we had, you know, workshop with the stakeholders, we brought into our findings and that was how the intervention was designed. So, so you know, I think in that sense, because we were, you know, involving, the user group, women who had already experienced violence to the stakeholders on, you know, what they think is good or, or you know, what they think can be doable, uh, you know, at the system level. So we, since we were going on, if, we, if you just remember, if, 
if people are aware, you know, we were going from individual level to the system level and consulting these people. So, so in that sense, you know, we were equally involved in the process, I would say. Yeah, but thank you so much. Um, we have another question that is, do you also not think minorities communities in the North are suffering with the Eurocentric views of healthcare, especially when tackling mental health and GBV? Um, do you not think funders should also focus on BAME communities in high income countries like US and UK? That answer is simple, yes. Um, you know, there's no question. One of the, th when I was really optimistic about global health, I thought that uh, if we really took a global view, we would understand that uh, health issues in the South Bronx um, were just as affected by global trends uh, and by global forces as health issues in Sao Paulo or, or uh, Soweto or, uh, you know, and that uh, global learning could actually be uh, multi-directional um, and that it would be possible to learn many things that would help uh, improve people's lives and, and health in, in the global north, um, often coming from examples in the global south. Um, and, and certainly I have tried to make the point, um, especially in work with HIV, uh, that the United States could learn a great deal from the success that Brazil had, at least during the first three decades of the response to the HIV epidemic by following the kinds of policies that Brazil followed. And I could go on a long tirade of enumerating what those policies are and why what is done in the United States is different from that. Um, but uh, unfortunately, that, that prediction or that hope on my part hasn't really played itself out. I still believe it. And I still believe that research on gender-based violence um, uh, in Southern countries and, and interventions developed to, to work around issues of masculinity, for example, um, uh, could, could have huge positive impacts. Uh, but right now, we don't have the structures for the global learning to, to take place. Uh, I think it's the unmet potential. Um, and, and actually, I mean, it's not, this is, none of this is a new idea, and it's certainly not mine. I, I remember when I was first getting involved in AIDS-related work, the director of the first global program on AIDS in the World Health Organization, Jonathan Mann, uh, talked a lot about global learning. How, how about, you know, uh, people in well-to-do countries could learn from some of the prevention work that had been done in, in very poor communities in sub-Saharan African countries or in other parts of, of you know, uh, the lower income Southern world. Uh, and, and in fact, I think that's true. I, I, a huge accomplishments have been made, but it's very hard to get Northern audiences to be, to, to recognize the fact that they can learn something from somewhere else. I think I'm making broad generalizations. I think the United States is actually one of the worst examples. It's, it's harder to get people in the United States to recognize that they can learn something than it is in Portugal or Norway. I, I mean, it just, it's, a, it's impressive to me that there are some countries that are just more close to the notion that they can learn something than, than others are. Um, it, so it's not, it's not equal everywhere, um, but, but uh, it, 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 it's a real challenge. And I think we continue to need to fight to, to, to do that. Yeah, it's a yes from me as well, because I mean, you know, decolonization is also about transformation and, and for any transformation in any, you know, any area, you need to challenge power, you know, you need to challenge the norms that's already existing. And, and, you know, you need to like, you know, you need to try to balance power, which is so difficult because it's also about, you know, behavior change, you know, and, and change in thinking, your mindset, you know, so, so transformation is all about accepting all these and implementing and practicing all these things, which, you know, uh, we cannot, we cannot change. So I think you have to try to change is, I mean, start from you as a, as a scientist or a researcher or, you know, or, or a global health expert, I think, yeah. 
Thank you so much. Um, another question that we have is how can we bring change in the ethos of research supervision and low income countries where project fellows are forced to deliver um, results, votes, according to a social political framework? How to let go the preoccupation with numbers in health research? And I think it goes back to what um, Unan mentioned, and it was really interesting. So if you. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there has to be this, you know, there has to be, I mean, we have to really shift the paradigm from just relying on numbers, because, like, for instance, you know, in a country where there is law for rape, for example, even one rape means a lot. And, you know, the person, the person who's being raped has to go through all those adverse effects, you know, the negativity, isolation, the blame game and everything, you know, it is too much. So, I mean, there has to, you know, we have to work towards transformation and, and, and our own challenge, our own norms and mindset, I think. And it has to start from us, ourselves. <laughs> um, Richard, would you like to comment? Um, I, I don't have a, actually a, a great deal to add. I, I think it, it is, is a huge challenge. Uh, again, it's, it's, the, it's the epistemological and disciplinary hierarchies I was talking about. There's a notion in public health, and it's not just in comparative global health research. It's in public health anywhere. Uh, I think it's true in public health in the United States. I think it's true in public health in Brazil. There's a notion that statistical methodologies are stronger, more true. Uh, the results that they give are more, quote, scientific um, than non-statistic. So, so it's that disciplinary uh, epistemological stigma and discrimination, uh, literally, um, and changing the minds of uh, the people who are trained in those paradigms is not an easy thing to do. Um, I've seen people change, I've seen people learn, uh, but it's inherent in the system and it's inherent in the academic institutions that the system has created. And, and so there's a whole set of forces that make changing that very, very difficult. Um, I do think uh, that um, some funding agencies uh, are, are more uh, able to be, uh, to have diverse uh, possibilities than, than others. So uh, in US funders, you're more likely to have a sympathetic ear from a private foundation like the Ford Foundation or the Mark Arthur Foundation or the Rockefeller Foundation, even although even those are different uh, than from the National Institutes of Mental Health. Um, in, in the National Institutes of Mental Health, we were able to find some program officers who were more open to qualitative methodologies than others. So it, it requires dialogue, uh, looking for people who are open to thinking differently, then creating dialogue with them about the possibility for doing things in a different kind of way, um, and, and then uh, continuing to convince people that, that that different way of doing things is something that offers insights that wouldn't otherwise be obtained. Um, some people will never be convinced. Most policymakers in most countries, North and South, want numbers that are simple. They want simple answers and they want recommendations that they can implement simply based on research that's simple. Um, so any kind of study, any kind of epistemology that recognizes more complexity and more, um, and more complex, diverse sorts of knowledge that is necessary is harder to sell to policymakers than things that are very simple responses. It's an ongoing battle. Yeah, <coughs> we have a question from Professor Ana Flavia, our PI here in Brazil. Um, she asks, what about language? Many things are lost in translation between codes and are not understandable outside the context. Language is a way of thinking and does not translate completely many times. And I think it comes from sometimes when we're translating our interviews, um, the people that are interviewing, we are interviewing, use concepts that were developed here in Brazil and that um, unlike the country, the concepts developed in the US or Europe, 
were not broadly translated and disseminated. So this has been an issue here. Absolutely. I, I mean, I'm, I'm especially, um, uh, especially uh, uh, sensitive to this issue, having, having lived and worked in two languages for about 40 years now, um, and, and knowing how hard it is to do translation that really captures the nuances uh, of, of uh, going in either direction. I mean, there, there are translations uh, from English to Portuguese that don't can't capture the nuance of English language terms. But English is a bigger problem in the field of global health because it's treated as kind of this universal language that everybody has to know, even if it isn't their first language and everybody has to be totally fluent in um, and that nobody will uh, be tolerant of uh, the challenges that exist for people working in different languages and 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 the I mean even the publication the the, the metrics for what researchers are are given awards for you know the award structure of research is to publish in English to uh, and 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 so that's it's just it's a huge challenge and there's never we almost never have funding adequate to the translation needs that we have um, so uh, it, it makes real challenges in terms of, of exchanging uh, information and it makes huge challenges if if investigators are not fluent in the local language and are collaborating on projects, it makes it really difficult for them uh, to, to, to be really good collaborators. Um, uh, and I'm not sure how to change that because everything is going in the wrong is going in the wrong direction. That is to say, with as the internet takes over everything and as English is the dominant language on the internet, any other possibilities seem to, to be out of shape. It may be that there will be some advances I and mean, artificial intelligence and, and, and uh, automatic translations today are much better than they were 20 years ago. So maybe that will, maybe there will be progress in, in ways that I can't imagine. But again, it's another area in which it feels like we're going backwards rather than forwards a lot of the time. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah. And then uh, just to add to what Richard has says, you know, I said, you know, I think, um, like, you know, I mean, how English has become a dominant language is also because, you know, um, when we think about this leadership transition or, you know, peer reviewers, you know, all these editors in or reviewers in the, in, in you know, within the journal or, or any other scientific discussion, you know, in places like, like that, that has also not decolonized in terms of, you know, leadership. So even a funder, a funding place, like for instance, maybe, you know, maybe, maybe let's say talk about the Research Council of Norway, maybe they could have someone from Nepal, or maybe they could have someone from, you know, like maybe they could have also, you know, like form this group so that it, you know, one can look into the context, whether it's appropriate or not. So anything that, you know, because even I come from, a, a, you know, from Nepal and, and English is not my first language. And, and, you know, the way it really makes me nervous, although, you know, I've been born, you know, I have been like, you know, I started my education in English right from my kindergarten. You know, it makes me nervous to really, you know, um, communicate in, in sessions like these as well. But I have to really force myself to sound right and not blunt. And, and you know, but sometimes, you know, it's, it's okay to have, you know, uh, you know, panels or, you know, peer reviewers from other country as well you know because knowledge is everywhere knowledge does not you know you know knowledge does not see that she's from nepal or he's from brazil or 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 anywhere else so you know so i think that is also something that needs to be incorporated and thought about so because decolonization has to be a, a real decolonization in that sense that you know the the panel should have be also multicultural if they really want to promote global health or international health, you know, across borders. Um, so I, I think that would be my, you know, response to this and, and maybe some thought as I was just listening to Richard talk. Um, Anna also added uh, that language also impacts a lot of dissemination that should be done in English. Um, there's a question here. I think it's um, for you. Um, 
Also, can you please expand on why studying trans communities is a taboo in Sri Lanka and Brazil, rolling back to a point mentioned by Dr. Vishal? Oh, yeah, but I think that was, uh, that was something I based on, you know, our discussion during the meeting about incorporating uh, having you know questions on lgbti community as well so so that came up in the discussion so so probably it's something to do with social and cultural you know practices or beliefs you know around uh, heterosexual or heteronormativity or uh, so, so i think that's the thing so i i don't think there's any other issue as such yeah just, just Thanks one thing that I, I'd add on the, the language issue, and I recognize that this is different in, in different countries. Um, in countries that have a large academic infrastructure in a non-English language, you can uh, find ways of, of uh, doing dissemination in both languages. Um, so that the, the, the project I mentioned on religious responses to AIDS in Brazil, um, because we had five university professors uh, who were pretty experienced and who, um, who were able to publish in English, um, but, but also more than able to publish in Portuguese, we created a, a dissemination plan, which assured that almost everything that we wrote in one language would be published in, in the other language as well. Um, and, and we spent a lot of time and energy doing that and, and some money, but it, a lot of it depended on our willingness to try to do that. And Brazil has uh, an, you know, an infrastructure of journals that you know, is excellent and that um, is, has actually more funding in some ways than the journals in, in the United States to, to do publication, sometimes in both languages, for example, because it's part of, it's a national priority to also disseminate in English things that are being published in Portuguese and, and, and using the, um, the, the resources that come from the academic, or, or at least it was before the current government. I'm sure that's not true now. But um, in, in any case, um, you can design this into a, a study if, if you want to, and if there's a necessary infrastructure. That doesn't mean that in every country there's going to be. Small countries are going to face bigger challenges in that regard um, because they aren't going to have the same kinds of academic infrastructures that big countries are, are going to have. Um, we have some few minutes left, and I think we um, answer all the questions. Would you like to have sort of closing remarks on those last minutes? Um, I don't have uh, uh, anything profound to say in terms of closing remarks. I, I do think that uh, it's an important discussion to have um, because we need to keep thinking about these issues. Uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm especially concerned with the fact that cross-national research, if we're not hugely sensitive to find ways to avoid it, easily reproduces the worst tendencies um, in the legacy of the field since the mid 19th century. And, and so the only way to overcome that is to, make, to, 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 to take conscious steps uh, to try to avoid it. And at that level, that's how I interpreted this session today um, and the topic um, when, when I was invited to participate. It was, was an attempt um, to continue to think critically about the way in which power shapes our concepts, it shapes the methods we can use, it shapes the research teams we can construct, um, it shapes the kinds of collaborations that we have. And if we're not reflexive about it and critical about it, it shapes them in bad ways. So the, 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 the first step in trying to be able to, to change things um, is to be reflexive and to be critical and to keep talking, to, 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 to have dialogues about um, what these things are. And, and so um, I just, uh, uh, basically acknowledge that, um, commend uh, the organizers for taking the time and interest in, in, in terms of wanting to talk about these issues um, and, and say that it's an uphill battle, but we have to keep fighting it. Thanks very much for, for the invitation to participate and, and good luck on the, on the work that you're doing. Yeah, I think from my part, it was really, uh, it was really 
fun and it was really an honor to 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 you know share this session with richard and and i see that we have we are 35 participants so so in a way you know we have already ignited this you know the process of transformation through this session as well because you know uh, with the questions that we got you know it was really a joy to answer and you know reflect ourselves so it was also a mutual learning for me as I start my career into all these you know issues related to transformation and I you know challenging power and this uh, global politics also local politics as well so so I think it was it was really a joy to to have you know be a part of this session and, and answer all the questions. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the, um, to the two of you who had such interesting insights and shared it with us. We are recording the sessions because um, some of our participants could not join today. So we'll have more people watching. And I think it was very interesting and very productive. And I think you will ignite a lot of conversations in the groups that we all participate. So thank you so much in the name of the two groups, the HERA and VANSA organizing the workshop. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, bye. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.